it. Uh, well, welcome uh, listeners and watchers to a new episode of our Betak channel. Uh, yeah, Betak means a place where people sit around and gossip and talk uh, about the affairs of the of their village or city. And uh, uh, we normally, previously, we had uh, several uh, sessions and topics discussed, but mostly re related to Pakistan, and these were done in Urdu or Pashto, but specific very uh, to Pakistan's issues. And uh, in this session, uh, yeah, this, um, um, uh, let me introduce, my name is Asim Jan. And in this session, we want to bring up some, uh, you know, international dimension also, uh, because uh, we think that countries are interconnected also in the world. And uh, so, uh, so we have uh, as our uh, guest, Mr. Jeff Brown. Mr. Brown uh, has been a long time social and politi political activist, a thinker, a writer, uh, in England, uh, and uh, uh, advantageous point for us is that he has been to Pakistan several times uh, uh, for, for some assignments, and he has uh, met uh, all walks of like of people in Pakistan also and interacted with them. And so he knows uh, some, uh, uh, you know, somewhat all along several years about the developments in Pakistan also. Uh, so, so welcome, Jeff Brown. How are you? I'm fine. Very well. Good to speak. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, Jeff, uh, uh, is the uh, winter finished and spring is coming in England? Just just the first signs, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, fine. Okay. So, uh, yeah, well, welcome, Jeff, and uh, it's good to talk to you again after some a little, uh, quite a long while, because last time I think we met in Karachi a lot of years yes. ago. It is uh, some time ago now. Yes. Yeah. Good to meet again. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like uh, whenever you came to Pakistan, we discussed these issues, uh, mm. you know, uh, issues of Britain, issues of Pakistan, third world like Pakistan and international affairs. So uh, so I thought uh, we can talk a little bit uh, on the same same things, uh, you know, here also. Uh, so sure. uh, of on, on things that may be, that uh, would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, a common Pakistani or a common Britisher would be interested in. Sure. Yeah, so uh, so um, uh, we can start with the uh, you know we Pakistan uh, is experiencing has been uh, having up and down in its crisis with democracy and with economics for for mm -hmm. quite a while, and uh, uh, and Britain has its own would have its own issues, but but as a common. Pakistani has a quite a, you know, since our uh, problems we think are so extreme that we tend to think that uh, uh, West developed uh, developed uh, world or Western Europe and America they they, uh, they have achieved a lot and uh, they uh, we idealize also and we think that uh, um, by uh, getting some ideas from there, we, we could also progress. For example, about democracy, about free markets, uh, mm -hmm. uh, economy, uh, and uh, so uh, so. Um, uh, can you give some perspective on this? I can. Um, I mean, I think the, the first thing to start with is to uh, argue that the distinction between first, second, and third world doesn't really work these days. That though there are huge inequalities globally, mm. we find within each of the different parts of the world, 
enormous inequalities. So we have huge inequalities in the United States. Uh, life expectancy for a child born in uh, New York, uh, in the poorer areas of New York, is worse than the life expectancy of a child born in Cuba, even though Cuba is a much poorer country than the United States. I give that as, as one example. Mm. But more importantly, and I'll just make this point briefly, I think we have to recognize that we live in one world and that the real forces which are shaping the world are not divided into different sections. That if we have everything from a COVID pandemic to a climate crisis to uh, a global economic recession to uh, a new war between East and West, all of these have an international impact and no part of the world is outside of this. Hmm. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, your basic observation. That, I would just uh, say one more, one more thing here, which is it's not only that the problems are never confined within national boundaries, but the solutions are never within national boundaries. There are no purely national solutions in the modern world. Uh -huh. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. rest at that point. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, uh, uh, you know, a, a novel observation of yours because, uh, yeah, normally yeah, in each country, uh, uh, the economists, thinkers, writers are mm -hmm. uh, giving you know, analyzing the their uh, problems of the, of the debt country and pro uh, prescribing solutions mm -hmm. the, for for the debt country's government to do or thinkers to do. But uh, uh, come, we can come to the solutions after a while. Uh, okay. But first, first of all, Fine. what are the problems that uh, that uh, yeah. For example, England is facing. OK, OK. Well, look, I mean, uh, there is a, um, a liberal intellectual called Adam Tooze who has recently started to use the word polycrisis. Uh, and his uh, argument, and it's not a controversial argument, mm -hmm. is that we actually now find that uh, we are having to look at different crises at once. There is no way of saying we'll deal with one and then another. We have to deal with them simultaneously, uh, hence the word polycrisis. Uh, and I've mentioned them already. I mean, climate, mm -hmm. global health issues, the question of the, of the world economy uh, and uh, the, the, the threat of military intervention across the globe. All of these are now basically interacting with each other in a way which makes the world uh, a more dangerous place. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. But uh, uh, if we, uh, yeah, that's a global perspective, but if we zone down to, let's assume England, so uh, uh, which, uh, right. okay. which, which okay. is the, for, for, you know, a four, uh, you know uh, from where the industrial revolution started and- uh, okay. So, All right. So, uh, and uh, it gave so much to the whole world through. In, yes, yeah. it did. It mm. did. But at the same time, it took a great deal from the, the, the whole world that uh, the accumulation of wealth at one end and the accumulation of poverty at the other is written into the history of Britain. Britain was uh, a pioneer of the, of the modern slave trade. Britain was the pioneer of establishing modern colonialism with the, uh, the exploitation of, of colonies. Pakistan, the Indian subcontinent, was on a global scale by far the most ex important example of uh, what was, uh, of course, an international phenomenon, but the, the British or English example was the uh, the first and the biggest for a very long period. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that uh, colonialism, uh, colonial legacy is there. Yes, the colonial legacy is there, and it's very interesting mm -hmm. that uh, we are now having a much bigger discussion mm -hmm. about our colonial history, uh, because. Many things have happened recently mm -hmm. with the growth of, uh, well, with the, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement after the killing of George Floyd in the United States three years ago. Mm -hmm. People have started to look at their own history to ask, what are the global inequalities? What are the explanations you give for these global inequalities? And again and again, people are asking for the historical Roots. You know, we should remember that uh, the Indian subcontinent was seen as uh, the richest place in the world uh, 500 years ago. If you ask yourself, why is the Caribbean originally called the West Indies? It was because the people who crossed the Atlantic, uh, Columbus in 1492, was looking for India. He wanted to find a an easy way to get to India, because that's where the wealth was. Now, we don't look at it like that now. No, so it's interesting how everything changes. But it's important, I think, to have this historical understanding of how the modern world was shaped. I would say, however, of course, that what I'm just talking about really was the ascendancy of, uh, of England in the 18th and 19th century, the 20th century, of course, has been the century dominated by the United States. And the question now in the 21st century is, will that continue? So that we're looking at a constantly changing picture and within which Britain becomes a less and less important part. It still has mm. you know, the most important global financial center, as it happens in London. But it's still, but overall, it would be wrong uh, to see Britain as particularly important. But at the same time, my argument is that actually the problem facing Britain, yeah. an economy yeah. which is not able to meet people's needs properly, which is vulnerable to all kinds of huge crises uh, as have been triggered by the war in Ukraine, all of these are actually no different from the much weaker economies of which Pakistan is is one example. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, but uh, you know, in a common man's uh, language, you know, could you explain that? Um, you know, for for example, a common Pakistani would, uh, for example, me, if I get a British immigration, I would love to come uh, sure. because uh, it's a it has democracy it has a bit compared to my home country a stable st more stability at least it seems to me uh, and uh, maybe uh, a potent uh, area to use my potential more and get yeah. get, get a get a job that uh, you know uh, that I can use my potentials sure sure so, and the technology and uh, so uh, so uh, uh, living in england how how do you people see uh, what's what's wrong or right uh, well, it's 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 a very big question in, in britain at the moment because what we have uh, is a very uncertain economic future but it is also the case that we have very serious labor shortages the uncertain future means that nobody knows how economic growth and employment will change in the next few years. But what is also true is that whereas we have a government which sees in its public arguments that one of the things it is doing is protecting Britain's borders and keeping people from coming in to, the, to Britain, at the same time, it is looking at huge problems. I mean, the labor shortages, specialists, people with particular skills in the health, uh, in uh, 
I, information technology, in engineering and, and uh, construction. There are many areas of, uh, of, of, of British industry, British workplaces, where there is very serious labor shortages. And so they are at the same time as they are trying to say, we are stopping competition from outside. They are actually worried about the fact that they can't get people to fill jobs. We have a huge number of vacancies. Um, and it isn't only skilled workers. Um, we are in the situation where much of the food that is being grown in Britain is actually thrown away or it is never actually harvested because we, the new uh, limits we have on immigration prevent uh, farmers from hiring the workers they need to work in the fields. I mean, th this is a an anarchic situation where government politics, are, which are very racist, it should be said, uh, are actually hindering mm -hmm. the development of the economy and the and indeed business owners who would normally support this government we have a conservative government at the moment are actually arguing that the government isn't looking after them properly uh, okay okay well well uh, so uh, you know in the in this global south or third world uh, uh, since since these countries like pakistan got got uh, uh, their uh, you know in urdu we call it azadi uh, that uh, they got uh, liberated yes. from yeah colonialism so yes, then uh, the, these uh, states started uh, you know the new new uh, that uh, how do we develop to mm -hmm. reach uh, to uh, aim at uh, uh, you know looking uh, at uh, uh, re reaching some stage around the west and uh, yeah. that the the normal uh, wisdom that was told and then what the uh, books of economics normally taught tells us is that uh, you, you know st uh, the state helps um, uh, build the environment in which the private initiative could work and the free market is uh, is led uh, to uh, uh, innovate and that's the way uh, a country develops. So, uh, so Pakistan in the initial in the late fifties uh, uh, and in the Ayub era followed followed to some extent these policies. And uh, uh, if we go by the classical books, uh, Pakistan had had a GDP uh, quite a uh, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, good high rate, of, high, yeah. high rate yeah. of GDP compared to other developing countries of that time, and then uh, uh, currently also, last thirty years, the same ideology. Uh, we are told that Korea developed, Taiwan developed, mm. uh, uh, following the same. Uh, whether they did it through the same policies or not, we don't know. Uh, you, we can comment on that. But normally, it's the mantra everywhere. India. Uh, every uh, they say that since india started mm -hmm. following the f uh, you know uh, state intervention got lessened and the free market is uh, was available so private initiative uh, uh, got the chance and then foreign investment also came with technology and that's the path so uh, but and pakistan government since last uh, i think since mid 80s so that's around uh, 35 more than 35 years is is also following that path but uh, we are not so, uh, uh, we haven't seen much of those results so uh, so uh, uh, comp uh, uh, giving your uh, european or british examples what do you think about this well i think I'm going to answer your question looking at those elements which I think you can find parallels in Pakistan. I'm not going to limit my answer, but I think that I'm focusing on trying to get people to to see how the real pressures for the way in which the world has changed in the last 50, 60, 70 years 
are actually the same no matter which part of the globe you're in. So if you look at the world in which uh, Pakistan and India became independent, this was a world where governments still played the dominant role in economies. Partly it was a transition from the war economy, but also at the level of ideas, people believed that the, uh, the ideas of John Maynard Keynes, that the state had the capacity to regulate the economy and that this would prevent the return of global recessions, as had been most importantly in the 1930s. This was the dominant set of ideas. Uh, and you had uh, the model which was being followed by some countries of what was happening in Russia, which was growing very fast at that time, uh, where the state made pretty much all the decisions to examples like Britain, where the state controlled larger part of industry. Uh, uh, and this gradually uh, became less and less successful. It was not the same in all countries. Uh, okay. Those countries which had a big military spending grew more slowly. Those countries which grew, which had low military spending, and the main examples are the two countries which were defeated in World War II, which are Germany and Japan, had much higher rates of growth. So Germany had a 5% growth rate, Britain and the United States had 2.5% growth rates. Now, if you, you mentioned uh, Taiwan and South Korea, what is really interesting is as this model becomes less and less successful, as you get a situation where the economy fails to grow and at the same time, you have rising inflation, there is the argument that you need to make sure that industry does not have all of these taxes to pay, that the state does not play the same role. And we have the, uh, uh, the change, which in Britain is called Thatcherism, in the United States it's called Reaganomics, where the idea is that you cut the role of the state, you cut taxes, you encourage uh, businesses, uh, and the free market will then bring higher growth rates. Now, this is what uh, was introduced. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund in the 1980s established what was called the Washington Consensus. And if you went to the IMF for a loan, they would give it to you on condition that you privatized, that you cut subsidies, you cut taxes, all of these I think you're familiar with in Pakistan, but the point is that these were happening everywhere. There was no part of the world which was not doing this. The success stories, and this is the key point, the yeah. success stories were focused on the world market, not a free market probably, but the world market. Uh, and so I'm thinking here of South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, but what they did was they focused on particular export markets usually high-tech export markets if they, as they worked to develop their economies, and they were very successful in competing. And in the 1990s, China followed their example uh, and in a period of 25 years became the dominant manufacturing force in, in the world in terms of uh, global uh, exports and in, uh, of manufactured goods. My point here is that it's important to understand that in all cases, the role of the state has been important. In all cases, it's been important to understand that it is more difficult to achieve success if you have high military expenditure. Uh, and that in all cases, you have to make sure that though you don't prevent your skilled workers from leaving, they can go and come back and bring new skills that you make sure that uh, you are able to attract or keep skilled workers who are going to be part of your economic development. And I'll just finish by looking at the example of Taiwan, which is a small country, you know, 30 million or whatever the figure is. Uh, Taiwan is the most important country in the world for the future of information technology there is no other country 
that can produce high-tech goods without the chips which are being produced in in Taiwan. And I just make the point that when you look at Britain, we are having to try and work out how we will catch up. Yeah, the United States is having the same discussion as is Germany. Uh, you know, as is China. They're all at how they can find the tens of billions of US dollars needed in order to be able to maintain their competitiveness and their economic growth. The point I'm getting at here is that the old idea that there was a hierarchy with first Britain at the top, then the United States at the top, basically Europe there, uh, and, and then Asia and Africa, they are the third world. This doesn't fit today at all. And when you look at the position of Pakistan, it's not that there is some special quality in Pakistan. It is just that all of the problems that I've identified elsewhere, Pakistan has you know, a very unfair situation where it, it has more than its share of these difficulties. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, in Pakistan and in, in India also, I observe in some other countries, uh, you know, the debate uh, revolves around that uh, actually the main issue uh, is corruption, you know, or morality sometimes mm -hmm. of, of the public officials or, or the politicians or bureaucrats. So, uh, so if the, the they become more, you know, morality uh, improves, or there there are checks on their, uh, you know, uh, corruption, then the country would get get better. And then we had this in the whole. Uh, we had a political party, uh, Pakistan Tariq and Saaf, which was yes. just uh, you know, which has this main slogan that uh, previous. Yes previous main parties uh, haven't developed Pakistan because just because they uh, they, they, they uh, their uh, office holders are corrupt and yeah this uh, so their whole slogan was that they will bring uh, yeah, development in Pakistan by uh, bringing in non-corrupt people and uh, uh, what is uh, your view about uh, like in Britain, is the is the the same debate goes on, or uh, compared, or it's about the uh, some other you know economic structures are important. No, it, it it I mean first of all the situation is different, but it's very interesting what mm -hmm. you say because we have had more discussion about corruption in the last few years than in the previous 30 years or 40 years or more, maybe. Mm -hmm. What we have, of course, is the example of what happened when the COVID crisis struck and mm -hmm. the government immediately started to spend billions on uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, and uh, the contracts were being given out to the friends and relatives of uh, the government ministers. And we are now waiting for the uh, report, which will tell us what we already know, that there were very few proper controls on who got the contracts. Uh, so the corruption is something which we certainly have, but I'm not saying it's the same. The interesting example, I think, is to compare China with, um, with Pakistan. Because, of course, if you know anything about China, you know that there is a huge amount of corruption in China, no question. Uh, about it. And the government tries to do things about it, but it with very limited success. The reality is, however, that China over the last 25 years, many of these years, has had a 10% growth rate. Mm -hmm. And when you look at why is that, it mm -hmm. is clearly because the state has directed investment and ensured that you actually have Something like half of the national wealth every year is not being used for consumption, but is being used for investment. That in practice means that wages are being held down, but at the same time you are having a high growth rate 
and so wages are actually rising. So it's low wages, but they're they're going up year on year. Mm -hmm. And so broadly speaking, that has kept things stable politically. But the mm -hmm. point about it is that uh, if you don't have this state directed investment, which is often carried out by private companies, but they are given all kinds of incentives and in some days cases simple instructions it's not a question of choosing you are told you will now be part of the development of this power yeah. station you will be part of developing this railway uh, mm. scheme and so on these are things which have been done on the basis of a very high level of state planning and state control with a very clear intention of maximizing the economic growth rate i would suggest that that is nothing to do with the problem of corruption. It is actually to do with whether or not the state takes control and ensures that there is economic development, which, and I'll finish on this point, is directed towards being able to sustain a growing share, not only of the world economy, but as a part of that, share of world trade. So China has become you know, the world's largest manufactured exporter uh, mm -hmm. uh, and as such you know uh, is now as we know the second largest economy in the world is there some is this because there is no corruption in China absolutely not yeah uh, well if we uh, will come to Britain you know uh, yeah as you discussed that you and the corruption uh, discussion is more nowadays but corruption would have happened during the last two, three hundred years of capitalism of England also. So, well, in various ways. So, uh, uh, but uh, what what are the, you know, structural issues with economics, with free market economics that uh, Britain uh, has not, uh, is not performing economy is not performing or the uh, you know rich poor gap may be increasing because of that yeah i mean the rich poor gap is growing but that's nothing there's nothing british about this this is something which you will find everywhere i mm -hmm. mean mm -hmm. i i like to give people the quotation from a few years ago but not very long from a man called warren buffett warren buffett yeah. is, I think, the fifth richest man in the world. He, uh, his company, Hathaway, is a major investor. Uh, and Buffett himself is the big shareholder, and his personal wealth is, I think, around the $80 billion mark, you know, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is his quote is, uh, I won't try and do his accent, there's a class war and we're winning. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the fifth richest man in the world telling billions of people, uh -huh. he is the rich class, you're the poor class, there is a war between us, and you're losing. Now, I think that's something which in their bones, most people know. It's not a secret or anything. But you don't often get the rich telling you the mm -hmm. truth. And that's what we've got here. But, but, but yeah, well, but um, yeah, you know the common sense view is that uh, you know people have different abilities, and some people have more entrepreneurial skills, mm -hmm. and uh, so if a government or a society allows uh, uh, you know free, uh, uh, people to do, such people to do business, like uh, for example, Mister you mentioned but uh, but in Pakistan so the uh, these people will uh, uh, bring in uh, do business and then bring in get, create employment and then the uh, as as this uh, class of businessmen or and small business medium and small businesses these grow that country's uh, economic growth would be there employment would be there poverty would be reduced and, uh, you know, the overall, uh, overall situation would improve. Okay. So 
the word that is often used in Britain to describe what you've just talked about is the word meritocracy. That is, we are ruled on the basis that the people who have merit, who are able and talented, are the mm -hmm. people who rise to the top. Some yeah. of them will become important politically. Some will become important in the economy. Uh, but the basis is their talent. Now, the reality is, and this is something which can be shown by the sociological surveys, any country in the world, that the biggest guide is to how who are the people who die rich is the question, is the answer is who is born rich, who is born into a rich family. The biggest single determinant of your social fate, where you go in society, is who are your parents? Are you born into an upper-class family, a middle-class family, a working-class family? The chances are you will die in, in such a social class. Of course, there are famous examples of people who have become extremely rich, the Jeff Bezoses and the Elon Musks. But these are very important people. I'm not de decrying that. But you cannot describe the United States economy, multi-trillion dollar economy, with what has happened with a handful of individuals who have become extremely rich. The reality is that most people will become rich on the basis of being able to have a very expensive education, having what uh, some people call social capital, which is the social connections which your family has in terms of what you, not what you know, but who you or your family network know. Uh, and this will determine whether you're successful in your career. That is the actual reality of the of the world we live in. And I would argue there are no countries where this is an exception, though the situation is is different in different countries. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I, can I, I just quickly say a yeah. little more on this? Yeah. yeah. There's a very interesting book which I recommend. I think you can probably find a PDF somewhere called mm -hmm. The Spirit Level. And it is written by a man called Richard Wilkinson and a another writer, uh, Kate Pickett, uh, and their book, The Spirit Level, which is the idea of looking at the balance of society, uh, is about inequality, the opposite. And what it does is it looks at the 20 richest economies in the world, and it looks at all the social ills from uh, early mortality, you know, child infant mortality, uh, poverty, uh, crime, you name it, all these issues. And it finds that uh, the countries which have the greatest equality are the ones which have the lowest crime rates, which have the largest, the best life expectancy, uh, the lo lowest level of child mortality, etc. Uh, and the two examples on one hand, which have the greatest problems because they have the greatest inequality amongst the top 20 economies of the world are, first of all, number one, the United States, and number two, Britain. And the best countries in the world are Sweden and Japan, interestingly. Um, the, the other countries in Scandinavia, like Finland and Denmark and Norway, fit the pattern of Sweden. Uh, Yeah, so uh, uh, Jeff, you were explaining, uh, 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 I think you were making a comparison that, uh, you know, a growth uh, in traditional economics is called the GDP increase rate. And versus, versus uh, that's used as a common indicator of the development of a country. But you were explaining that uh, then inequality uh, uh, is something else within an economy. So could you a bit elaborate a bit on it? Well, it's actually arguing that inequality has a social impact, a huge social impact. Uh, uh, and the, the statistical data are very clear that mm -hmm. where you look at all kinds of social ills, whether it to be health outcomes or crime, uh, life expectancy and so on, you find that the growth 
of uh, uh, these problems is paralleled by the growth of inequality. And those countries amongst the, the richest G20 countries of the, of the world, which have the least inequality, have the best outcomes when it comes to health and, and welfare. Uh, and so you have on the one hand, you have the unequal, that is the United States and Britain as the two worst examples. On the other hand, you have countries like Sweden and interestingly Japan, which have the best outcomes in terms of societies with social peace, where people's life expectancy is good, their general welfare is good. It's very interesting to contrast mm -hmm. Japan and Sweden very quickly. Sweden, like the whole of Scandinavia, Finland, Norway, Denmark, has got a tax system, which means that though the pre-tax income is very unequal, the post-tax income, which people live on, is actually much better than the rest of Europe, in particular better than Britain and the United States. Japan is little different. Japan actually doesn't pay uh, its managers very high wages. There is actually a much lower mm -hmm. differential between the highest and lowest paid, but the outcomes are equally beneficial. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but but uh, the this uh, uh, the you know common sense economics or what we would you call it um, says that uh, when uh, the country which uh, has free market which is a developed country like America for example and uh, innovation has innovation and and has once it has GDP growth and has millionaires and innovations. So then the wealth trickled, trickles down and uh, and everybody, you know, uh, uh, everybody benefits from it. But uh, well, I, you are contradicting it here. I'm contradicting it. I mean, I'm saying that where you look for the evidence, you will not find it. That those countries where the uh, the tax burden on the rich is the lowest have no evidence that there is a benefit to the poor from the high incomes of the rich. It is simply not the case. Uh, yeah. Jeff, your screen. I'm OK. Yeah, you got back on the screen. Yeah. So yeah, so you can continue. Well, I, I I'm I'm making the point, uh, and it's not you know a very controversial point that uh, the uh, negative aspects, the negative qualities associated with the free market approach, uh, are not only that you get uh, greater economic instability and greater inequality, but then this in itself creates a society which is uh, more dysfunctional, less a less harmonious society. I'm not saying that these are great societies. I'm simply saying that they're societies where people can expect to live longer, healthier lives. Mm -hmm. And um, you you mean to say that, uh, yeah, in a, they, that those societies may have uh, this, internal dissent well yes but because the class they will have class, class divisions are there then the, the, it is a really a, 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 i mean one si simple example is um is the uh i mean i just take sweden sweden has a very very high class healthcare system which is very expensive uh but it actually uh, does not lead to the middle classes wanting private health insurance. It's actually so good that they know that a private health system could not give them as good health care as they get through mm -hmm. the state health system. Mm -hmm. um, I give you one more statistic um, on this. 
Uh, Britain now spends about nine to 10 percent, more like nine, actually, nine percent of GDP on health. The United States spends roughly double that figure, something like 17 percent of GDP on the, the United States is spent on health. The question is, is the population of the United States healthier than the population of Britain? And the short answer is no, it isn't. When you ask how can you have this, this incredible difference, you only have to look at the way in which a private system needs huge amounts of administration, all kinds of costs, vast bureaucracies running insurance companies. Uh, the fact that on every ward, somebody is kept, every time you, you need to go to the bathroom and a nurse has to help you, that is added to your bill. Uh, that is time wasted in order to uh, note the cost and collect the money uh, when you finally uh, are finished with the yeah. with your health care. I'm just making the point yeah. that uh, uh, yeah, I the crazy that. way of administering but, health. But Jeff, you will know it yourselves only too when, well. When we take the example, for example, of Sweden, when we're there are higher taxes on businesses and uh, professionals incomes so mm. um, then the you know the classical economic tells us that this is a demotivation for business and for professionals and then such businesses would move out of the country uh, or uh, to other countries and new investment would all wouldn't also come that's what stand, uh, you know, the standard economic tells us. So uh, why isn't Sweden's in, uh, you know, businessmen going out to to spend somewhere uh, their investment somewhere else, or the professionals going to some other country to save their taxes? Well, I mean, th 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 this does happen. That that uh, so that it's not the case that people don't uh, hide their money from the tax authorities in Sweden. Uh, but essentially, uh, there, is a, uh, th th there is a recognition that the alternative to have everything private is not actually going to raise people's living standards. You might individually be able to go to another country with low tax rates, but what you won't get there is cheaper health care, you won't get ch cheaper education for your kids. You won't get uh, a, a, a form of social security, which is going to ensure that you and your family uh, will be able to survive any kind of uh, catastrophe that you would get in the welfare system, which is provided in Sweden. I mean, that is a, a very brief answer to your question. I think the, um, the important point to make uh, it's a, it is a very expensive system, yeah, uh, and there are constant attempts by governments in Europe to reduce the cost of welfare. Um, uh, there were two and a half million workers on strike in uh, in France two weeks ago. There will, I think, and I think it's next week. Excuse me, I think it's next Monday or Tuesday. There will be a general strike in France because. There is a state pension scheme, which at the moment guarantees that you can retire when you're 62 years old. Uh, and the government wants to change this, I think, to 64. Uh, so, you know, these are, there is nothing guaranteed about these, uh, these welfare provisions. They have to be, they were created by people fighting for them and they will have to be defended by people fighting for them. Okay. Well, uh, uh, we, here we, talked about you know the countries that have already you know developed and reached a stage uh, couple of you know a lot of years ago then those colonial country post colonial countries like pakistan you know which uh, at at their uh, inception were uh, had very little industry so uh, so uh, uh, here uh, the uh, you know the uh, we don't have those uh, 
all those uh, we haven't reached that stage so well, uh, see, I, and, I, I, uh, I want... yeah so yeah. so the the question is what options does uh, such countries have when, well you see i want to, i want to um... and uh, here you can come up with your your issue about the global solutions you are talking okay about. well i th i think maybe we should leave that for another time um okay. but I just want to make a point about your stages mm. idea. I think it's you know it's a very common presentation that you know societies go through stages of development. But I think it's very important to recognize that if we were having this conversation three hundred years ago, people would have looked at India as a more advanced country than than England. England was rising very rapidly three hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. But the real wealth was still seen as India. And of course, the East India Company was in the process of, frankly, robbery. Mm -hmm. If you look at how they accumulated their wealth, most of it was simply stolen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Using military force, uh, you know, there was a famous uh, governor of Bengal, Warren Hastings, who was put on trial because of corruption. And he basically admitted it. He just said, but I was really the, the, the smallest in this battle to steal. Uh, others were much bigger than me. Yeah. And I think that it's very important to understand that, you know, that the world operates not on the basis of a set of logical stages, but in terms of, of conflict. And this conflict is the main reason why much of Asia is has been poorer but actually you know even that is something you shouldn't take as fixed it's these things are always changing yeah okay so yeah so uh, we uh, you know our discussion leads to more more uh, questions and uh, sub sub uh, sub ideas and very you know we are uh, enriching debate could continue so i think we can leave uh, uh, let our listeners yeah. listeners come up with their, their, what they have in their mind and uh, you know uh, in our next uh, session uh, we can take take on from here and uh, come up with more more topics related topics yeah. so uh, i look forward to it i look forward to it as yeah, yes uh, Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. For a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Goodbye for, for now. Yeah. yeah Looking forward to our next time. Okay. Bye now. Bye bye.